I'm Dave Wainwright. I work for Butterfly Conservation. Um, I work in the Pickering and Helmsley areas, attempting to conserve two rare butterflies, the Duke of Burgundy and the Pearl Border Fragillary. So I'm here today in a, a sort of wet, rainy woodland with not much chance of finding butterflies, but I'll try and explain a little bit about what I do. Basically, the two butterflies in question have two habitats in which they live. They like calcareous grassland, that is you know, limestone-rich grassland, and uh, woodlands based on limestone. But the one thing they're intolerant of is shaded conditions. So if you look behind me, this is an area of woodland coppice where the conditions beneath the hazel, these are these multi-stemmed plants here, are very, very shaded. Could you just quickly describe what coppice is, Dave, for those Coppice who might... is basically where you cut back a tree and allow it to regenerate from the stump. So instead of having one tall straight tree, you have a, a multi-stem thing like this, where lots and lots of stems grow right. out from the base. Right, and that's often hazel, but not hazel, exclusively. Not exclusively hazel, no. There are, there are lots of trees that will regenerate in that manner if they're cut. Uh, only broadleaf ones, obviously conifers and things like that won't do it, but um, hazel is the one that was, you know, historically managed in that way the most because the, it grows really, really quickly, so you get lots of small diameter timber uh, in a short time scale sort of thing, and historically blocks of woodland would have been coppiced uh, and left to regenerate while the, the forest has moved on and cleared a, an adjacent area, which is very, very good for these butterflies because they, they sort of fly into the area that's been coppiced, that's been opened up where the sun can get in and where the plants that they need, the sort of primroses and violets, are very, very abundant. You know, all the wildflowers come back as soon as that shade's removed. And as it grows up, the conditions become unsuitable, but the butterfly was historically able to follow the foresters, if you like, and move into the next woodland block. So a, a, a large forest would have sort of a rotating pattern of open land, which is absolutely brilliant for the butterflies. That's absolutely perfect. And yeah. at, that, at that point in time, the butterflies were doing really well and were really, really common. But uh, unfortunately, uh, market forces have changed. There's no longer that uh, um, local market for small diameter wood, uh, you know, narrow, thin poles that there used to be. And that type of management has gone by the by. So all the coppice has grown back, no one's cutting it down, and the conditions underneath it are really, really shady, which is why a lot of these woodland colonies of butterflies have, have gone extinct within the last 30 or 40 years. Right. So your job is to restore My, the, the woodland management to an extent? That is the idea of it, yeah. I mean, some of it is experimental. We don't know quite what is going to regrow when we start restoring these, these old coppice woodlands. But... Um, you know, the, the aim is really to, to uh, provide an impetus, if you like, and funding, you know, draw down funding to do this, to actually start managing blocks of woodland in this way. Can you just tell us about the Duke of Burgundy and the, the, why it's so special? Duke of Burgundy is a really, really rare butterfly. If I was going to pick a British species, which God forbid it won't, but one I would put money on being the next one that we lose, it might well be Duke of Burgundy. We're down to about 80 colonies nationally, and around 10 of those are in the North York Moor, so as an wow. area, you know, th this is crucial sort of thing. Uh, if you look at the distribution of the butterfly, we have a tiny handful of colonies in the North York Moors, a few more in the South Lakes, top end of Morecambe Bay, and then nothing to the, you know, the, the extreme south of England almost. So if we lose the butterflies from this area, they ain't going to come back. There's no way they're going to make that jump and, and find their way back. So it, it is absolutely imperative that we conserve them. Um, Duke of Burgundy is, you know, you'll look in the books and you'll see nice big pictures of it that look like they're really, really big things. They're actually tiny, they're maybe, you know, three quarters of an inch from wingtip to wingtip. Uh, they fly, you know, sort of late April, probably through May, most of May and maybe into early June. Uh, and then they finish for that year. They lay their eggs on uh, cowslips and primroses, which is... Only? Only those plants, yeah. Right. Uh, which you would think wouldn't be a problem. Those are common plants. They're, they're found all over the place. But in fact, they need to be growing on a, a sort of limestone-rich soil. They need to be in a certain condition. They need to be growing in sunlight. They need to be a certain size before the butterflies will lay their eggs on them. So they're actually very, very fussy. Um, too fussy for their own good, if I'm honest. Right. And chances are today that we're not going to see one because it's a bit damp and a bit cold. How's, how's this spring actually been for them this year? Um... 
I think we were very, very lucky. Um, I was very, very concerned that the really hot weather in March had brought them on to the point of emergence just before the weather turned cold again. Um, had that happened, I think it would have been a very, very bad year. But in fact, it seems like it, you know, we've just about got away with it. The weather turned good just in the nick of time and the, the numbers on the, on the better sites have actually been pretty good this year as they have for the last few years. Um, you know, it'd be nice to think that Butterfly Conservation and our partners at the Forestry Commission and the National Park and other organisations had helped to play a part in that because we've been managing these sites for quite a long time. I mean, the work we're now engaged in is spreading out from the core sites and managing sites like this one that are pretty marginal and trying to get them in suitable condition for the butterfly to colonise. That's the idea because if we're stuck with just a handful of sites where the butterfly is found, uh, and it doesn't spread out any more, then it's, it's always, always going to be in trouble sort of thing. Those, even though I say the numbers are, have been good this year, we're not talking hundreds of butterflies, mm. we're talking handfuls sort of thing. So they're always going to be vulnerable. I mean, basically, to you know, make the future of this butterfly secure, we need to get it back on more sites, and that, that's what we're working together to try and do. Right. OK, let's go and have a look at an area that you've, you've copied. OK. OK, so uh, moving on from the last woodland block where conditions are very very shaded. This is an area where we did some work last winter. Um, uh, we were basically successful in drawing down a grant from our funders called REN who are a, a landfill tax redistribution company and basically that money has been used to hire local contractors to sort of manage some of the, the local woodlands with the permission of the landowners. Um, so this area was clear, the coppice was taken down last winter leaving these uh, stools. Stool is the name for the coppice stumps and already you can see yes. this vegetation coming back. Oh, we've got a caterpillar there. Not Duke of Burgundy one, but a caterpillar nonetheless. So it creates quite good conditions for lots of other things. So um, previous to this day, this was the, the ground here before you coppice. Uh, was there's very little ground floor at all at that there, point? There, there was very little ground floor. Yes, yeah. I mean if you if you look behind, you can you know see how shaded it was. Yeah. Um, the idea isn't to permanently clear these areas. As I said before, the idea is that these coppice stools regrow, as you, which as you can see this one's doing. Yeah. And in so doing, that you know although that builds up the shade, it actually suppresses things like brambles and bracken and, and tall grasses which just smother out the wildflowers which the butterflies need. So the idea is not to keep this permanently open, it's for the, the aim is for the coppice to grow back. In the meantime, we'll have moved over there, cleared a new area, and the butterflies will breed in here for a few years till it becomes overgrown, then they'll shift along hopefully. This, this is the, the theory, and it, it, in practice it, we know this is what works for the butterfly. And this is the, the kind of ground area you've got here would be a typical sort of size or would you prefer something actually bigger than this if you had more manpower? Um, Is it good to have... In isolation this area will be too small but in fact we've, we've done several other clearings dotted about the, the main ride through this woodland sort of thing so we're not, we're not just looking at this one area sort of thing. Obviously the bigger the better, the more habitat you create. The, the important thing is is that you always leave enough standing woodland to move into sort of thing you don't want to do too much too quickly otherwise you you know you might get an area that's very very suitable and gets lots of butterflies in for a few years but then when you're looking at the next bit to manage you suddenly find you haven't right. got the right sort of habitat left you, you've taken out too much too quickly so it really is a rotational thing and it's not just the duke of burgundy is going to benefit from this it's and uh, it's other insect species but also different types of ground flora which might be swamped out yeah absolutely you know the, all the what the flowers that the butterflies use the prim, primroses uh, there's violets that are used by fritillary butterflies uh, but there's all sorts of other things things like wood anemone which is kicking about in here um Twayblay orchid which is that plant there with the, all these things Sorry, say that again, Dave. What's uh, that one? I think that's Tway Blade Orchid. Right. Uh, there are other things that Quite rare. benefit, you know, things like Bluebell, uh, Woodruff, which is a little white flowered plant there. And it's also good for, you know, sort of certain woodland birds are very well adapted to, to living in coppice areas, sort of thing. I mean, that diversity of structures generally is really, really good. So anybody who's, got, who's watching this who's got a woodland, you know, a decent sized woodland, they can always sort of replicate this and... and they can uh, replicate it. They may not have Duke of Burgundy and Pearl Bob fritillary butterflies on the doorstep. It'd be very, very nice if they did. 
but um, you know certainly there are wildlife benefits there just bear in mind there are things that need you know sort of old standing trees and dead wood as well so the aim really should be to, to you know maintain a diverse structure and have some areas where the light can get in and just one word about the people who are doing this coppicing work tell us who they are uh, it's a combination of people. Um, con you know, we've got local contractors who work for us, um, which obviously in this current time is, is a really, really good thing to be able to help local people find, you know, work. Um, we've also got volunteers who can do, you know, make tremendous help uh, with the work we're doing. For example, a man with a chainsaw could clear this area in a day, but what we don't can't really do is leave all the stuff that's been felled lying on the floor because you know that's still creating poor conditions for the butterfly so either the contractor has to drag the stuff to a fire site and burn it or we can use volunteers to help in that way which makes the money go further so you know the, the volunteer effort is really really critical and of course we, we are pretty much dependent on volunteers to monitor the populations of these butterflies to go out and look for the eggs on the plants which is may sound very very tedious but um, can be quite rewarding in a strange sort of way, but also go out on nice days, count the butterflies. You don't get much better, better things to do than that. So if there was somebody watching this and they were interested in becoming a volunteer and helping out this area, who would they get in contact with? Uh, probably me. I, I would be the starting point for that. Uh, okay. I guess the contact details will be posted on the website when yep. this, this uh, clip goes out. But uh, by all means, get in touch. I'm always looking for more people to count butterflies. Uh, uh, don't panic about identification. If I can learn it, anyone can. So, um, you know, it, I will sort of give you a bit of a hand, I won't just like chuck you out there and uh, let you do it without guidance. Well it sounds like a brilliant thing for people who are out walking and out and about enjoying the countryside anyway, doesn't it? It yeah. is, it's absolutely superb, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'm nearly 70 years old, well not really, but uh, <laughs> I don't look bad on it, but um, no, it, it, it is a really um, uplifting thing to do is go out on a nice day and look for, you know, just taking the time out of your busy schedule and counting butterflies, looking for th butterflies, you find other things all the time, you yeah. find the wildflowers, the plants, the birds, you know, the, it, it is an absolutely amazing way to get into to just understanding wildlife a bit better. Yeah. OK, let's go and have a look at one of the other sites. OK. OK, so we've moved into, a, a, you know, a bit of the woodland a couple of hundred yards away sort of thing. This is a, a main ride going through, and the rides are really important connective features so the butterflies can move along them. They need sort of open space that gets the sun for them to be able to hop from one patch of managed woodland to another sort of thing if they they won't sort of explore through shaded woodland to get to places so the, the sort of connective features are important this has been cut back for a, a little bit longer this is sort of pushed back about five years ago and this this big scoop taken out when the conifers were being thinned and the effect has been the same you can see that there's quite good uh, regeneration of broadleaf trees underneath you've got bracken coming in uh, lots of red camping, that's that pink plant in the foreground, buttercups, good nectar sources, you've got vetches, um, got marjoram coming through. Uh, there's really, really good diversity of plants, as there is on all limestone, really. Once, you know, once the light is there and the moisture, you get real, you know, real uh, wildflower diversity, and the conditions are absolutely ideal for butterflies. If, if the sun was shining today, there'd be, be butterflies of all types flying up and down sort of thing hopefully dukes that would be nice but um, butterflies nonetheless um, and you can see compared to the last site the vegetation on the ground now is getting quite tall it doesn't matter because the the main aim of this is, is to enable the butterflies to keep moving through the habitat so we're not too bothered but you can see that the um, primroses which the butterfly uses are still here this is a lovely big plant here just the sort of place a duke of burgundy would pass by and lay its eggs uh, particularly a couple of weeks earlier in the season as the grasses wouldn't have been as tall. So I'm hoping to find an egg but I probably won't because the camera's on me. <laughs> but we did find some earlier. They were tiny little white specks weren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're, they're sort of like very miniature golf balls. If you look at them through a, a sort of hand lens they, they, you know, magnify them about four times. They look like a tiny white golf ball on the leaves and they, you tend to get you know, a small number, maybe one egg or anything up to about five or six on a plant. Uh, the caterpillars will hatch in about two or three weeks after the eggs is laid. They'll feed up quite quickly sort of thing. The caterpillars are horrible looking. Are they? What, like, do they what, what do they look like? Uh, they look like little brown slugs and they feed at night sort of thing. So they're, they're not the easiest to find. Um, and then they'll pupate into a, a sort of chrysalis. 
and that chrysalis will stay in the vegetation right the way through the winter till the next spring and then will emerge as an adult next back in the next April, early May, something like that, and you know the cycle will be continued. Right. So can you just, before we sort of finish off, tell us about your your job then, because you, you're all over the place, you're not just in, in North oh, York, yeah, yeah. I, I sort of uh, inflict myself on people all over the north of England. And basically I cover a really big patch um, from Yorkshire to the Scottish borders in the east of the country and from Cheshire to the Scottish borders in the west. I've even got the Isle of Man lumped in with my patch. Thank you. Um, fortunately for me, or unfortunately for the butterflies, there are lots of places within that area where the conditions aren't right for rare butterflies. There are vast expanses where I'd never get to go because there's simply no longer any rare butterflies to, to sort of justify me going and working there sort of thing. So the, the main areas in which I work are the sort of South Lakes area around top of Morecambe Bay, which is brilliant for rare fritillaries. Really recommend you get a look in some of the limestone woodlands over there. And also North York Moors, which is, is if anything, Maybe has one or two fewer species in the Morecambe Bay area, but the, the sites are less well known, they're less well trodden. A lot of them are private. So there's always a prospect of turning up something new, finding something really exciting. Um, so it, the, the things are out there sort of thing. I mean, if you go on the high heather mall and you've got things like large heath and small pearl border fritillary and midges <laughs> and um, you know, on the on the sort of moorland fringes in the, the wooded valleys and things, you've got things like Duke of Burgundy, you might get lucky and find pearl border fritillary as well. Um, dark green fritillary, marbled white, you know, on some of the grasslands. There, there, there is a really, really high number of species that, that live in the North York Moors area. And that's without touching on the moths. I also do moths, but uh, we'll, we'll stick to butterflies today because it's a, a butterfly area that I'm in. But sadly, the, you know, the picture overall for butterflies, like many species, it's, it's not good at the moment, is it? It's not really good. I mean, we, we sort of have a bit of a conflict going on. Quite a few of the species that are common seem to be getting more common. There are quite a few pushing northwards, you know, uh, whether or not that's down to climate change, who knows, but there's loads of dragonflies, loads of moths, and quite a few of the butterflies that are expanding the range northwards and have done so for about the last 20 or 30 years. The real problem is, is that those changes are not been shown in the rarer species there are very very few of those that are responding in a positive way we suspect the reason for that is simply that the areas of habitat that you know they've got really specialized requirements so the areas that they can live in are few and far between which means that whereas the common species can you know they, they are common because the things they need are common they lay their eggs on nettles and things like mm -hmm. that so they can always just spread out as soon as that weather gets good enough they can head northwards but the rarer ones, you know, they've got such big jumps between suitable sites that they, they're just not colonising, they're just not making the same moves. They're, um, if right. the females leave the site on which they were born, they're 99% certain not to breed anywhere else because they simply won't find any suitable habitat. So that's why managing the areas around the, these core colonies that are left is so critical to their survival. They just ain't going to be able to move anywhere else. So the, the prospect is we are losing and will continue to lose probably butterfly species on a, on a fairly regular basis. Do you think? Uh, I don't think we'll lose species nationally maybe now. We're, we're sort of... Oh, really good. We're, you know, we're, we're sort of getting to grips with, you know, along with a lot of partners, managing the, the key sites. What, what does worry me is that we'll lose butterflies from the North York Moors area because, as I've stated, some of the rarer ones are so far away now, the, the next nearest colonies, that if we lose them, they're not going to get back for right. themselves. Right. So getting down to basics for people watching this video, what can they do at home? There's, there's the, the sort of well-known, uh, you know, let a few nettles grow in the corner of your garden. But what else would you suggest that people could do to help? Oh, uh, John, but, but, John Butterfly Conservation. Why not? And, and I mean, give a donation. Like yes, yeah. We, can, we, you know, we do use your money for useful things. But um, yes, I mean, gardens are brilliant. You know, that, that is the main sphere of influence that you've probably got in your life. You can certainly enhance conditions for butterflies for, by planting things that are rich in nectar. I'm not, gonna, I'm not a gardener, yeah. so I'm not going to list species. Yeah, we'll put that on the website. But, yeah. uh, you know, the, the information is out there. And it's also good for, you know, things like bumblebees and hoverflies and all these other things that are also decline. I mean, the butterflies are just one example. They're a particularly well-studied group. We know they're declining. Odds are that there's lots and lots of other things that are declining in exactly the same way. So the butterflies are you know, canary yeah. in the mine shaft, if you like. They're just an indicator that there's probably lots and lots of other things 
about which we know a lot less that are also on the slide. Okay, well, we, we'll all try and do something. Dave, thank you so much for your time. I know you're really busy, but I really appreciate okay. your time. Okay, absolute it's, pleasure. It's been great coming out here. Cheers, guys. Cheers.